Hello and welcome to this week's edition of BOI Weekly. I'm Olayemi Odunuga. The Bank of Industry's quest to empower Nigerians in various sectors of the economy is the reason behind the creation of the BOI Intervention Fund Scheme. The scheme aims to empower micro, small and medium entrepreneurs, many of whom have taken their businesses to greater heights as they continue to access funds from the Bank of Industry. One of such beneficiaries is Mrs. Munira Shonibare, who is the Chief Executive Officer and founder of IO Furniture Limited, based in Lagos. IO Furniture Limited is one of Nigeria's leading interior furniture manufacturing company, founded in 1992. And on this week's edition of the program, we take a look at how Munira Shonibare's IO Furniture Limited is adding value to the economic development of the nation. Our team, as usual, visits the office and showroom of the 30-year-old I.O. Furniture Limited, located at number 628 Industrial Street, off-town planning way in Ilukpeju, Lagos. Mr. Shonibare talks to us about the impact of the credit facility on a business and how the journey actually began. Old stuff. I think I'm taking out a box of this. I only have one box. One box. Munira Shonibare is an interior designer who specializes in the manufacturing of exquisite household furniture, mattresses, and other items that appeal to everyone with a good sense of taste and quality. Her company, IO Furniture Limited, driven by a passion of creativity and design, started business in 1992. According to Mrs. Shonibare, her quest to start the company began as an idea having studied interior design. With the ban on importation of furniture into Nigeria at a time, IO Furniture Limited expanded from an interior design outfit into a manufacturing company. IO Furniture Limited prides itself as a full-service interior design, retail and furniture manufacturing company characterized by their uncompromising quality and innovative design solutions. She takes her crew down memory lane, explaining how the company began with 10 workers. I always started, it was more of an, an idea at first. Um, my background is in interior design. I studied interior design in Italy 1982 to 84 and then worked with an architectural company as an interior designer and the desire was to practice as an interior designer. But then I began to experience a lot of challenges with sourcing for locally manufactured items by local industries. They either did not meet the required standards, the quality was always um, uh, you know, an issue. And um, at first, I used to, to, to support the interior design, I used to bring in, import the furniture and accessories. And government uh, policy changed. There was a ban on uh, furniture. I didn't want to get involved in, you know, the. Um, importing um, items illegally. So, embarked on the backward inter integration by setting up um, the manufacturing just so that I could have total control over quality, um, time, and the design. So we started as a really cottage industry with about 10, maybe 10 um, factory workers, 10 carpenters in production using very manual machinery and manual tools. Um, we had a team of about four interior designers, two or three people on the shop floor. So in total, there were no more than 15, 20 of us um, as a company. So it started really, really small. And we sort of grew organically. The growth was organic. The turnaround happened after I executed quite a large project at the Transcorp Hilton where they asked us to refurbish the rooms and that gave me, at that time, at the time that was happening, there was that really strict ban on furniture. And as I said, because I didn't want to embark on furniture, I approached my, my um, suppliers in Italy and asked them if they were willing to come and set up a factory here. And they actually explored the possibility and said yes. So we came up with a plan. Uh, they came down to Lagos, looked at, because we were working out of this um, space at the time, the at same the same space, um, 
uh, came up with all the did all the numbers, and that gave me the courage to um, put up a business plan, of course, and then approach uh, BUI for a loan um, at the time. So that's um, that's that that's what gave birth to um, IU Furniture. This was in 2000, and we started manufacturing here uh, manually in 1992. But that restructuring happened in 2006, 2007. So we've been here for 30 years as a manufacturing company. Creativity and design, yes, that is my passion. That's what I wake up every day, and look forward to enjoy doing the interior design is interior design and the arts is my passion manufacturing i got overtaken by events as i said i never ever foresaw um, a career in manufacturing but what's important is i identified experts in manufacturing by collaborating with italians that that's what they do that's their forte that's what they do exceptionally well they're the you know they're the leaders in um, furniture, um, etc., etc. As, as I said, um, backward integration to address the needs of, you know, of the market. The desire to expand the business led Mrs. Shunibari to approach the Bank of Industry for a credit facility, a decision she describes as her best business resolution. You know, I first of all took a loan um, from commercial banks, Sterling Bank, and um, Access Bank. And we started to struggle with repaying the loans. I think the interest rate at the time was about 25, 26%. And luckily, Central Bank came up with the, inter the BOI intervention fund. And that's how we heard about it. So, so there was a BOI um, intervention fund of course we heard about it and we applied i have to say the process was painless they were really 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 um help helpful very very supportive and i'll tell you what it did for us especially as an sme it actually encouraged and made us begin to keep our books properly and you know ensure that um we document properly because most smes don't really pay attention or you know appreciate the importance of ensuring that um, your documents are in order so that you give yourself that really good um, corporate rating and the corporate um, governance. So what be the BB what I'll tell you the value. The value that BOI has added is in ensuring that uh, you pay attention to corporate governance. You ensure that um, you keep your books in order so that when you're applying for the loan, it's easy for them to process. There's also a bit of hand-holding because they come over, they inspect, and uh, I think we're on our third third or fourth loan um, from BUI because every time we, we want to grow, and I'll tell you what it did. Uh, the loan, we experienced a 1,000% a growth due to the loan. So from employing, I think, 40 people, it, we grew to about, we're currently at 130. The turnover grew from uh, um, 40, 50 M to over 1 billion because of the loan. Because at least with the money, um, we also make sure that whatever it is, you, you, you have to do the, do the numbers. Make sure, you have to make sure they're very clear about what you're taking and utilizing that loan for. So we were sure that it was for the machinery, equipment, and of course, making sure one has a complete understanding of the capacity of the equipment and the market that um, the market is there for, the, for, for your products. So you, you know, it was a really interesting learning curve for us because it forced me to begin to pay attention to ensuring that um, we were able to meet the numbers to pay off the loan. Mm. Application, okay. we apply again. We took the first loan, which we paid off over six years. So did that um, successfully. 
we actually then we applied for a, a, a second loan that was a much smaller amount paid that off in about a year or two and we're currently on our third one as a matter of fact we got uh, the award for best performing SME from BOI <laughs> so we're very proud of that fact and so they just you ensure that once you pay it gets the process gets easier and easier and easier because then you've built an established trust and you become a you become a regular um, customer of BOI with innovation functionality and style at the heart and soul of the company they deliver perfection consistently as the founder of IO Furniture Limited shares her challenges. Constantly reappraising the business. You've got to constantly appraise the, your business, the performance of the business, bearing in mind the fast changing environment that one is catering to and learning to make sure that um, you develop the ability to adapt. To, to evolve, to make the required adjustment quickly. Uh, 2020 was a huge, I believe, lesson for everybody because 2019, we sat as a, as a company, came up with a strategy uh, that we we're going to diversify into retail because we're predominantly a B2B business, just catering to other businesses, banks, the hospitality industry, real estate, um, and all of that. And then um, COVID struck. We had to get back to the drawing board and decide that, oh gosh, there's, now we've got this pandemic that nobody was prepared for, nobody saw coming. What do we need to do differently? How do we remain a sustainable business? How do we continue to generate income? How do we be, continue to be customer-centric? Um, so we fast-tracked our e-commerce platform, which we had been, you know, toying with, but e-commerce platform we had said we we're going to begin at 2021 and with covid we fast tracked it to 2020 and that was how we could stay in business during the pandemic because we started to we make sure that we established the e-commerce platform and people could go online order their goods and then we would um, make the deliveries for them of course the items changed we are talking about much smaller items as opposed to the huge but it sustained us until um, you know, we all started to recover from the pandemic. And from an interior design perspective, of course, how you begin to utilize spaces, we began to offer people um, various ideas about how you have multitasking, because a lot, of, a lot of people found themselves suddenly at home, working from home, and had to make that adjustment and convert their spaces into work areas as well, and how to do that without getting too um, claustrophobic or feeling confined. So it's been a really sort of interesting, interesting journey. It's constantly evolving. You know, it's, as I said, we collaborate with a lot of um, local manufacturers and um, the bed desk, um, we identified it through one of our suppliers. We had it in our showroom and nobody paid. It wasn't, we had one or two people buying it, but people didn't pay much um, much attention to it. Come COVID, and suddenly you're stuck at home all day, not enough space or room for a desk or table, and suddenly the bed desk became a hit because you could sit in your room at your bed, have this desk, have your laptop or your iPad on it, and work with a little space for your drink or your phone, and people found it really, really, really um, useful. So, you yeah, know, that was, uh, it, it was a very uh, successful product. Ah, first of all, you've got, to be, you've got to articulate exactly what it is you're offering. What is it you want to do? You've got to articulate that first. Secondly, know your market. Who is your target market? Who are you catering to? Is there a need for your product or service? Make sure you have that very clear um, identification. Most importantly, do your numbers. Sit with somebody who's been there, done that, especially about numbers. We don't, as an entrepreneur, I made that mistake. I just focused on my passion. Oh, I love, you know, 
uh, designing spaces for people. I love selling furniture without doing the numbers. What's your, um, what, what, what are your fixed costs? What are your profit margins? How much of various items do you need to sell to break even? How much do you need to sell to, um, to make a profit? Who are your target audience? What do they want? What is the selling cycle? How, what's their, what's their buying pattern? So for us, for instance, our busiest, busiest period, Q4, from October to December, it's manic. Our quiet periods are between January and March. April, May, June, you find that then people begin uh, investing again. July, August, everybody's on holiday. September, people are paying school fees. So, you know, huge expenditures. So nobody wants to be talking about anything else. Then come December, oh, everybody's preparing for the festive season. They want to, up, to uplift up, you know, upgrade the looks, their, their, their homes and their spaces. So you've got to understand all of that. You've got to have a complete understanding of the business or service you are, you are going to be providing and make sure you're on top of the numbers. No, it was honestly, it was the intervention fund. Of course, when if you're in business, it's your responsibility to make sure that you find out everything there is about the business. It's your responsibility to know exactly what financial options there are available. It's that's that's you you've got to. You can't say you're a business person and not inform yourself, not become knowledgeable about the environment you're operating in from funding to the marketing and uh, marketing and sales to operations to um, admin you've got to ensure that you're constantly you're constantly updating yourself about what's going on in your environment and how um, the regulations or the environment affects whatever is happening affects your business be it finance operations um, marketing, you've, you've, it, 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 you have to, otherwise, you know, the business, it, it won't be um, um, sustainable. I also have, maybe it's my upbringing, um, you must, you can fall or pick yourself up. You have to, you can't just refuse to stay down. The, the curve balls will come. Um, one of my favorite um, philosophies is, look, I have no, absolutely no control over like COVID demonstrated, I have absolutely no control over um, what's going to get thrown at me, um, what the curveball is, go is going to be, but I have control over how I choose to respond. So, yes, disasters happen, and you have two categories of people. People who decide, oh, it's all over, or all right, so disaster has struck, I'm going to start all over again. And it's that willingness to be here, to, to start all over again. I think um, I'm a, an optimist by nature. Um, for me, the alternative is not an option. The alternative is just not, not an option. You've constantly, you've got to keep looking up. And yes, they, they, we've had some really tough, we've had a fire here before, 2017, we had a terrible fire. Um, a third of the company was completely gutted out. And at the time, oh, I had my staff all looking at me and thinking, gosh, is it over? And, you know, we spent, the, we spent two, three days trying to put out the fire. And um, at the end of it all, I just, I just called for a meeting with everybody. I said, listen, we've had a fire. Thank God no one has died. Nobody got injured. Nobody even went to hospital for any issues whatsoever. Thank God. I said, I'll tell you what's happened. We all, all of us here, we all just have more work to do. So let's start. From your signature classics to the custom projects design, such as bed desk, wooden cup holders, 
Ayo Furniture Limited has built a stellar reputation for excellence, quality, reliability and integrity as the company rose from a major setback to claim its place as a market leader in the furniture manufacturing industry. IO Furniture Limited's core operations involve interior design, consultancy, manufacture of bespoke furniture and sale of manufactured furniture. The company has designed and refurbished high-profile projects in Nigeria. Oh, it's to say to thank, first of all, to thank uh, BUI for being our partners, for being our collaborators, for listening, for adding um, the re real value to supporting industries in Nigeria to grow. Because without, we, honestly, without BUI um, giving us the sort of financial support that we require, we would not exist. We simply would not exist. So it is just to continue to do more, um, more of the same. I don't even have to think about it. Skilled manpower. People ask every day, what are your challenges? I go power and manpower. We have to invest in people. We have to. We've got to invest in our youth. We simply have to invest in people. 70% um, of our population are 35 and under, We've got to invest in them. That's the future. No industry or economy is sustainable without the right people, without educated and informed people. It's not sustainable. I, I think we need to, um, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of, a lot is being done but there's still a lot of ground to, to cover. Um, from where I'm standing, um, I believe we need to invest a lot more in the vocational training and the technical schools. Not everybody can be, uh, we can't all be doctors and lawyers and engineers and architects. We need that solid support structure of with the lawyers, you need the paralegals, with the doctors, you need the nurses, with um, a, an industry such as ours, we need the machinists, we need the carpenters, we need the upholsterers, we need the painters, we need the joiners. Where are they? You can't find, there are no technical schools that will teach you how to do properly. We need the electricians, we need the mechanics. Who's going to, your machine breaks up. Every time we're going to set up a new machine, we have to fly in an expatriate because we don't have machinists that are experienced enough to program um, the 21st century equipments that are being done today. So we have to, they have to, those, those um, vocational schools have to happen. And then they've got to begin to also take a critical look at the curriculum that are introduced in universities and in tertiary institutions. Take Germany, for instance. Um, universities are free. The technical and vocational schools, you've got to pay for, because that is where the demand is. There, that's one. Secondly, there is a collaboration between um, academia, government, and industry, i.e. they are constantly talking to the industrialists to find out what they require, what sort of skilled manpower they require. Government invests in that skilled manpower. Academia churns them out to support industry. So it works. We have had to introduce our own training for our carpenters, for our sprayers, for our posters, for our interior designers, it, it's now part of um, it's part of the business. A very robust training program. It distracts from what we're what we're what we're supposed to be doing because we, you are forced to become a school as well. We do, and we fall. Uh, we we suffer the risk of you, you invest and train and they get poached.
by everybody. So it's, it's a cycle. And yes, I, we console ourselves by saying, well, that's the um, contribution and that's the impact that we have on our community, fine. But it can be, um, it's expensive. Over the years, the Bank of Industry has continued to provide interventions for various industries to thrive. And there is absolutely more where that is coming from. So if you're an entrepreneur in need of support to grow your business, you can reach out to the Bank of Industry by visiting any of the branches closest to you or log on to their website at voi.ng. You can also follow the bank on all social media platforms as displayed on your screen. Well, that's it on this week's edition of BOI Weekly. I'm Olaemi Odunuga. Thanks for watching.